Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Today on the uh, Dig It podcast, we're delighted to be joined by Michael Jones. And for once, we're actually face-to-face with our guest, which is a first for, uh, for, for Dig It. So, uh, good morning, Michael. Good morning, Chris. And uh, how do we find you today? Fine, yes. Uh, I, I like this uh, autumn weather when it's not too hot and uh, one can get work done. Indeed, indeed. It's been, it's been a, an interesting year, I'm sure, in the, in the garden. But uh, I suppose we're going to be talking about uh, apples. So I suppose we need to start at the beginning. How did you get into to growing apples? Well, my, as a child, brought up in Yorkshire, and my parents in the mid early 1950s bought a house with a bit of land uh, first they planted a dwarf tree which um, produced the most lovely red yellow and green apples mm-hmm. um, big ones uh, it seemed big to a four-year-old anyway <laughs> and they were delicious and that was actually a James Grieve right so um, I learnt my first apple name um, fairly young my father was very proud of his efforts at that time, there was uh, a requirement for anybody with a bit of land to have an agricultural use of it. It was still rationing, and the first year he grew wheat, uh, the next year he grew potatoes, <coughs> and that was actually quite a lot of hassle. Mm-hmm. So then he decided to plant an orchard. Right. I can remember some of the names of, well, obviously Bramley. Uh, Laxton Superb is a dessert apple, uh, Howgate Wonder, and of course, more James Greaves. And so we had a good supply of apples uh, through my youth. So that was my yeah. introduction. Okay, so Michael, did you actually get involved in sort of planting and pruning these these trees? With no, them, oh no, 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 no. It's early days. No, no, no. My father was very much. Uh, they were grown as stand, uh, standards. Mm-hmm. Um, and in those days, uh, one put a perfect circle of, of, of digging of clear to keep the ground clear around mm-hmm. it. And uh, th- th- this, this was one of my memories of a, right. a, maybe a metre and a half bare soil all around the trees. Uh, but I just, um, all I did was um, eat the apples. I enjoyed them. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah I didn't. Uh, we, 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 we did have to do a lot of help in the garden, uh, so he grew vegetables and mm-hmm. we all had our jobs there. But I don't remember ever getting involved in pruning no. or anything like that. That was to come, basically. That was to come, yeah. yeah, indeed. yeah. So sort of, sort of moving on then from then, from your experiences as a youngster, um, when did you sort of, sort of get, get into, involved in actually wanting to grow apples in, in numbers and maybe with a, an end product of, of, of cider? Well... We got into, uh, I got married in the mid 70s, mm-hmm. and it's obviously when you get your own house that you start to get interested or get back into gardening. And uh, we were both outdoor people. Uh, first of all, we got into community woodland development. Uh, there was an opportunity in our village to acquire a bit of land, and uh, we put a proposal up to plant woodland trees. Okay. That was about 1980, that, and we spent a lot of time looking after it, so we, 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 we did that, and by the 2000, there was a bigger opportunity, based on our confidence in what we'd done there, to expand it, and everything came together just right with the county council, the district council, wanting more woodland in the area, uh, landfill tax had just come in, Okay. and, and, I, I, and I had the contacts on how to get the land which nobody else seemed to have so we managed to buy about six acres which uh, was next to this smaller bit that we'd done initially and uh, and some money mm-hmm. okay. and uh, we um, mainly planted the lots of uh, the native trees of our area things like ash oak and field maple mm-hmm. but we put lots of other things in community orchards were at that point getting quite well known so thought we're bung in a community orchard and also among the trees we put in we got a load of I think you call crab whips Mm -hmm. 
they all came from here, actually, from Buckingham Garden Centre. Those trees. You, Excellent. You did That's well that. Um, you did well that time. Um, so that all mm. developed nicely. Mm-hmm. After a couple of years, we started getting lots of apples. Particularly interesting. We community orchard. Yes, that was mm-hmm. there for everybody. And the the other apples, we were quite surprised to find that these crabs were giving us big, almost edible, in some cases quite nice, other times a bit bitter apples. Okay. And there was a sort of thought, well, what can you do with these apples? And I think we'd been down to one of your apple days. We'd seen Pauline doing her demonstration of, um, of pressing apples and handing out little samples of apple juice and thought, mm-hmm. this looks pretty good. And I think at the same time, you got um, Sarah Juniper and her yes, indeed. father yes, sir. Yes, indeed. Yep. doing uh, apple sampling. Mm-hmm. And she got some lovely apples. Uh, and it sort of broadened one's thinking um, beyond the half dozen well-known names of, mm. of, of varieties. So those sorts of things all, all built our uh, interest. Yeah. Michael, you were saying about sort of community orchards. How, how many, you know, the logistics of that, putting it together with like, like-minded people within the uh, within the village. Yes. How did that sort of work? Did did you have sort of a a rotor to to do sort of different sort of tasks? Was it sort of handed out? Did you have sort of a, a regular meeting of how the, the the orchard and the the community area was going to be developed? No, I'm afraid I just did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? Okay. Lots of people came out for the plantings, um, good. That's good. provided somebody got it all organised. So since then I've spent a lot of time talking to other groups and visiting and things like that, and I've seen where you may get 15 people on a committee to look after a, a community orchard, and nobody can agree. Uh, fortunately, nobody really wanted to particularly get involved, so I just got on and did it. Did it. Okay. And, well, once it's planted, i cut it twice a year and prune it and it looks after itself and it just works so we the bigger area we use a contract to cut paths so our whole concept we've we've managed to acquire in our village 11 acres of right. community land now okay and it's laid out with well cut paths and wild areas mostly so they're not don't require a lot of effort mm. and the community orchard is working well pleased to see a, a load of some of our older members in the village with their shopping bags going up there uh, last week and uh, you think good yeah, good you know the, that's the, the interaction you want isn't yeah, it? yeah the plums yeah, yeah. have been very good this year and the cooking apples always go down well and good yeah uh, yes yeah. yeah, so, mm. so so that's yeah. that's just sort of happened in a minimalist way yeah. um, so could, could you just sort of paint a picture of the actual orchard itself sort of lo- logistics of it, yeah, yeah it's fairly near the village Mm -hmm. uh, just maybe two or three hundred meters away Mm -hmm. so it's not too far to go initially we i think we put in we came down here and bought about 20 trees Mm -hmm. two of this one of that you know we didn't really know what we were doing but (laughs) whatever you got (laughs) and uh, mainly apples a few pears a few plums a couple of quince since then i've slipped in a few more over the years um that's now you see 20 years old Right. And um, one or two have not really fruited very well, so they've had the chop and put mm-hmm. something else in. Yep. I think we're up to about 50 trees now. Okay. I have to admit one or two of the woodland trees may have disappeared to make a little bit more room on the edge. Of course, so, th- natural yeah. thinning, yes. Natural thinning, <laughs> yes, in order to get the odd extra fruit tree. Yeah, that's good. So, I mean, to talk about these varieties, we, we mentioned, or you mentioned a little bit earlier about whips, so... Yeah. For our listener, I mean, should we just sort of do yeah, a little bit of explaining? It, now, it's a very that. interesting subject, this, because apples, we, we have the English wild apple that mm-hmm. grows in the hedgerows. It's, it's a round apple, a small apple, generally never more than an inch in diameter, mm-hmm. or two and a half centimetres or something. Yeah. Absolutely bitter, <laughs> uh, certainly nothing you'd eat. Maybe you could make jam out of it. So that isn't... The crab that you sell or anybody else sells, uh, what they are, we later found out, is what we call wildings. Okay. Now, so a wilding, uh, wildings are the things that you see by the roadside where you see some quite nice looking apples, and sometimes they are, often still on the fruit on well into winter. And they are 
trees that have grown from pips that people have thrown out their cars. Right. And so these um, these crabs are really seedlings mm-hmm. of cider and uh, and dessert apples. Very useful, very useful, mm. very useful for uh, juice. Mm-hmm. One thing we found when we started pressing is that uh, they don't. The juice doesn't seem bitter, but mm. even if it's the apple's a little bit bitter, right. and quite useful to making cider as well. Right. So when you you were purchasing your your apple trees in the early years, and obviously if you're adding to, it's the rootstock, isn't it, which is quite important for your orchard size. Uh, yes. Well. We have stuck mainly to MM106, which is a, what you call a large, perhaps a largest dwarf. Mm-hmm. It seems to work quite well on many sites. I did come and stuck on one of the plantings. We, when I, the first sort of other planting I did, other than after the community orchard, was on unused allotments. Mm-hmm. There were, as I started to get more interested in these varieties, and either bought some or grafted them, then... I needed land, and I each year I'd rent another unused allotment mm-hmm. and put another dozen trees on. What I found there is that, well, the, one of the reasons they were unused was because part of it was quite wet. Right. Now, MM16 is not good for that, and so many of those died of crown rot, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, on another site, we found that... Um, in trying to straighten some trees, lifting them, they just snapped right, right off. Really, MM one hundred and six is very cl- classic. And, and mm. you looked at it, and it was a swollen area. So MM one hundred and six is not really very good on wet areas. Mm-hmm. The the other rootstock I have used is M twenty five, which mm-hmm. is the the very big, almost natural size. I've actually stuck some of those in my latest planting on the basis that when I get too old to cut the grass around them I might get a flock of sheep in and of course, and they'll be yes. big enough to take that while they would decimate MM106s but I am having to fight the pruning a little bit on some of those so, so with the, with the um, so the M25 you can raise the crown higher so you yes. can go to yeah all the yeah. all the sheep would yeah. do it for you you do it naturally yeah, yes. yeah 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 it yeah. was just a just a thought I'm no, I have I must admit I think on country file a few weeks ago I, I saw a, a little piece on on a, a, a orchard grower just doing that actually bringing right. in bringing in sheep as a, as a natural resource with yeah. wildflowers as well to try and yeah. tick all the boxes to keep the countryside that little bit more uh, in tune with with nature so that's yes. that's good so on the, the the varieties you've got on the the orchard um what has there been any any problems any you mentioned obviously about the rootstocks but any problems establishing your your, your, your trees well, apart from the wet areas where mm. they, they die, uh, let's think. On our, our current orchard, our big orchard, what we're really doing is centralising all the things we've collected by taking grafts and starting again, if you like, so mm-hmm. we've got them all together with more or less unlimited space. Right. That particular site is unusual in North Box in that it's actually a very light soil, a very nice, light, fertile loam, lower down higher up almost sand but the uh, the higher bit i'm not putting apple trees on so mm 106s are pretty good on there and if anything they're growing maybe too strongly certainly i've got no problems getting them to grow and i've got an awful lot of pruning work to do to try and uh, keep them down so maybe i've i need to think how to weaken them on the establishment side of things, um, I mean, what the actual process when you're putting a new tree, would you say, you know, say consider staking? I mean, it, you know, rabbit oh. issues and that sort of thing. Of the actual okay, thing. yes, it is a bit. It is a bit breezy, right? Okay. And I, I think last year, I did have thirty blow over, partly blow over, and I had to I, stake them up or, or prop them up actually. So that does mean I have to prune a bit harder to keep the size up. The, the, the wind factor on a tree, which is full of leaves and fruit, mm. is, is horrendous. I would try to lift it up again. And it's, uh, so that, 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 I suppose, is a bit of a problem that I have to watch. I, we did put in a, an extensive windbreak, which is sort of trying to keep a, ahead of the other trees. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's growing well. We, we used older, fast-growing okay. older. Yeah. 
but it's surprising how much wind you still get. So wind is, is a problem. Uh, I'm not getting, even though it's light soil, I don't think I'm getting any uh, water problems. I, I, I think there's no drought problems. Okay, good. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good soil. Mm-hmm. The structure's really good. Uh, I'm even starting to grow a few veg on it because it's, it's better than the allotments, to be honest. Okay. So, and sort of mulching and that sort of processes, would you, would you do that on a regular basis? Okay, yes. So in terms of philosophy, mm. I've, uh, you have to think how you, when you plant an orchard, you have to think how, how you're going to look after it. Mm-hmm. In my case, I decided to use, keep them in grass. So I, didn't, well, I don't like spraying. It's not that I won't spray. Not, I haven't got a, a total aversion to spraying, but it's expensive. It's, I don't like doing it physically. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. nice. It smells. and it's, yeah. um, So only spraying is something I only do if I really feel I've got to. So to keep the grass down, I, I let the grass grow long, maybe 30 centimetres or, or, or more. I then cut it with an appropriate machine, and, and then I rake it i ted it off with a with a rake to end up with grass with mulch around the trees mm, okay grass mulch yeah. and, and so <clears throat> once i've done that in the late spring the first time when the grass has grown that mulch will keep the trees free for most of the year they'll get a top up mm-hmm. i probably cut the grass every six weeks something mm. like that maybe four times a year three or four times a year so that's working well but I said maybe too well because I think maybe it, I, I may have to let the grass grow a bit stronger to s- slow the growth down a bit. Okay, so you, you, you're using it in conjunction with the, the vigour of the tree in a way. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's useful to know because I think uh, a lot of gardeners look at, at mulching, you know, grass mulching and obviously putting organic matter down as a you know, need to do. But in this instance, you're doing it in a, a very controlled way working on your experience of your, of your, of your trees. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Okay, on, Michael, on, on pruning, um, obviously it's always a bit of a debate when it comes to apple trees. Mm. Um, it's probably the most asked question we get here at the, uh, the garden centre. So what are your, your, what's your philosophy on, on, uh, on pruning your, your, your orchard trees? Well, first you decide on an envelope you want to keep it in. Mm. You don't want them all merging into each other. Mm. I space my trees four metres apart and rows five metres apart. They're already, after five years, say, starting to get a bit close. So keeping it within a certain size is is essential to not only to stop them growing into each other, but but also from the the blowing over point of view, the weight. Uh, You want the trunk to get more established, to get the roots established, so... Um, there's a dual thing there. So the tree is going to end up staying a certain size. I, with, with cider, there's a basic, a fundamental difference really between growing for uh, dessert apples and cooking apples where you want perfect specimens and you want them to store them in many cases so they've got to be totally unbruised. You've got a better reach every, every tree, mm-hmm. uh, every apple in, on a tree. With cider apples... You want volume, and it doesn't matter if they get bruised. You, you, in fact, don't want to pick them. You want to let them fall, because then you know they're ripe. Cider apples must be ripe. Mm-hmm. So you, you let the tree go higher. In many cases, much higher than I'm allowing. Now, I'm limiting myself. I'm getting a little bit older. I don't really want to climb a ladder. I'm only walking, working on my own anyway. So I use a step ladder. And five foot, uh, one and a half metres, is as high as I will go. If I can't reach higher than that, the top comes off and the branches have to go horizontal. So I'm perhaps not using the full benefit of the cider apple potential, but more than what a dessert apple grower would, would do. So would this be happening in the winter, this major pruning, or during well, the summer? The major pruning, the, the, the hard pruning uh, of bigger branches would be in the winter. But I do like to summer prune, especially for strong growing trees. Mm-hmm. In fact, only yesterday I had a friend down who was desperate to get out and prune some trees. And I was only too pleased to aim it at some of these 
really thick trees that failed to fruit this year because of the they had blossom but it, they, they it got frosted some of the lower trees so they look so dense and the perfect thing to do with those is to summer prune them get the growth off all the tangled growth get it thinned out so you can see through it you can look through it in the summer you're stopping all that goodness going back into the roots which would only produce intense growth next year the tree is more likely to fruit when you do that so that's really the philosophy if if a tree's fruiting well and not putting this massive growth out then it's fine just a winter prune that's the way i tend to yeah. to split it really that's good and, and do you do any 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 feeding at, at this stage either during the, the the summer when you're doing any no no i don't the trees in this latest orchard are three to seven years old mm-hmm. they the last thing they need is feeding right um, they need to man, most many of them are fruiting mm-hmm. quite well i think you'd only think of feeding if uh well from a, there's two sorts of feed aren't there really if, if it's not growing then you've got to get it a bit of nitrogen hmm. phosphorus i suppose yeah otherwise if it wasn't fruiting i suppose you'd, you'd want the potash a bit a bit more on potash is expensive though isn't it you're gonna have to go and look on the shelves and you see it's it's not something you want to throw about too much it's no. i do use a bit of bonfire ash now and then perfect but um only to use up the bonfire so no i i don't so no. i haven't found the need i may find things change as as years go on but at the moment my philosophy is no feed no spray and let's see how we get on indeed when we're doing pruning one of the big other questions asked is about sort of differentiating your your, your fruit buds and your your normal green yes. buds yeah it's, any thoughts on that well Michael? it's definitely worth getting to know them mm. it's it's because if you don't know the difference, then you're likely to lose next year's crop. <laughs> yes. It's not that you never prune off fruit buds. Uh, if there's plenty there or if they're in the way, then off they come. But you should be cutting them off in the knowledge of what you're cutting indeed. off. Indeed. So, yeah, yeah, in, in, indeed. Lovely. So, Michael, the whole aspect of growing plants from, uh, from cuttings, um, apples are not treated in that type of way the propagation of them is a little bit different isn't it and uh, i think we we often talk about cyan wood so perhaps you could just explain a little bit about what cyan wood is yes any um apple grown from seed is not going to come true Mm -hmm. so you can't replicate that delicious one that you've got that's dying by that method what you have to do is to take a cutting of it and join it onto a another rootstock, a, a tree that's got just a stem coming up mm-hmm. uh, that's been specially selected as suitable for grafting. So apples are very easy to graft. They, I should think I get a 95% take. Uh, you do it in February. Sometimes you have to wait till your rootstocks arrive if you've ordered them. <laughs> uh, but by March, you, you should have done it. Where do you get your signs from? Well, fortunately, there are the, I think they've been the country's leader, actually, the Midshire's Orchard Group, in in starting what they call a, a science swap day. For many occasions, it's been held, I think is likely to be held in the future here. At Indeed, the yes. Center. Hopefully next February at some point, yes. Good, good. So then various individuals who've got a lot of varieties or the organisers will make sure that uh, from collections there'll be some come along. For example, the Gloucestershire area is very keen to promote their specific Gloucestershire varieties and uh, often will supply a load of their rather obscure but interesting varieties, which um, I personally am working through at the moment to find Mm -hmm. out which ones may or may not be good for cider making. Probably the only way you could get to try these things is to graft them yourself well in fact that's not entirely true because on the cyan days that are organized there's usually a few expert grafters who will do it for you for a small fee and uh, buckingham garden center here always have some root stocks available at the right time so make sure you don't forget to look up the date when it's available sometime probably february i personally have simplified the technique the most common one is is known as whip and tongue mm-hmm. the tongue bit especially if the if the samples are a little bit on the thin side is quite difficult to do 
and so I stopped doing it. I just left okay. off the tongue. I just do a whip okay. uh, graft, and uh, which effectively is just a diagonal over about five, six centimeters. Mm -hmm. You're just cutting the, the scion, the, the variety you want, and the rootstock to match. Trying to line up the the edges where the cambium is so that they all merge together. And uh, personally, I I just use parafilm, which is mm -hmm. a stretchy self amalgamating tape. Mm -hmm. The traditionalists will tend to use rubber bands with and melted wax, which is looks very impressive. But I've never been down that route. I think I I, I did start with some of the traditional grafting tape, which is a lot more like sellotape without the glue on it. Indeed. And I found that quite difficult. Uh, well, it, it doesn't self-amalgamate for the start. Well, the beauty of parafilm is it does merge in. Mm -hmm. You can just go around and pull it tight and, and it's sealed. Yeah, I say that's what we're trying to achieve, isn't it? A complete sealed That's the important around. bit. It's yeah. got to be sealed in order that uh, yeah. the air doesn't get in and it yeah. dries out. Yeah. So apples and pears are, seem to be pretty good i found some stone fruits well stone fruits uh, can be a bit more dodgy with mm -hmm. with grafting perhaps better budded in the summer yeah I, I have yeah there is the alternative process if you either timing wise you only think of doing one in the summer you can bud that's where you just chip out you just cut a little two three centimeter long bit off a off a leaf stem mm -hmm. that you've trimmed off just to the stem and cut a matching bit on your rootstock, and uh, again, just bind them in. That also works quite well. Yeah, and that's chip budding, isn't it? Chip budding, yeah. that's it. And I think that's used quite a lot. Yeah, during the um, during the summer, the uh, stone fruits are. I think then, then it's yeah, yeah, yeah. You you generally stone fruits are best done that way. July, August time. Yes, yeah. It's more difficult with a with other apricots and peaches. I have managed to successfully graft, but this last year, a total failure. I think that was the frost. I think I got them planted out in April, and we had that terrible minus fives, and uh, everything died. So Certainly North Buckinghamshire, we had, I don't know, 14, 15 nights of, of sub-zero temperatures. Yeah. Completely it, unheard of. Yeah. Um, that's it, obviously it, not good news for, yeah. for for anything producing either flowers or, or trying to produce any new growth. Yes. Yeah. So budding gives you a second chance. Some, if the rootstock survives, uh, you can uh, have another go. Yeah. So... Try and talk us then, maybe Michael, through the process. So you've you've taken your your uh, effectively your graft. Your, your little scion has gone onto its rootstock. What happens next, timeline wise? Yes. So you just uh, leave it in. Uh, well, I having done it in February, I tend to do it on the table inside because I don't like being cold. I having bound them together. I do I do wrap the. The, the roots in a plastic bag because the soil all over the carpet isn't terribly popular. Of course not. I've then maybe got half a dozen. I've done it in one go. I put them in a pot with some nice compost on in the greenhouse mm -hmm. until the weather gets a bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, then I will plant them out in an area I call my tree nursery. Okay. Uh, just an area where anything that's budded or, or grafted spends until they get planted out. But, but I suppose if you haven't got that space, you haven't got the luxury of your own little nursery, you could just continue to grow them in, in a, a pot. I, quite, I, yeah, I, yeah. Yes, you could, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, I wish I'd, you know, if I'd have kept them in the greenhouse in pots rather than planting out. I thought I was safe in April, yeah. but, but I wasn't. So I didn't, didn't actually do any apples this year, so I don't know if they would have suffered, but, but certainly stone fruits suffered terribly. And then um, if they're going to go, then... Within a year, uh, I'd normally give them a season, keeping an eye on them. Right. Well weeded, of course. Yeah. And and then um, ready to plant out. So would you actually physically uh, prune them, trim them, pinch the tips out? Would you just let the plant just grow as a single sort of straight stem? Then, or they, It's amazing how varieties vary. Some will shoot up in one year a metre. Mm -hmm. and others sort of throw out lots of side things and branches and uh, take their time. So you can't rush those. But they may end up with a stronger trunk, perhaps. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about how to plant, how I plant mine out, mm. well, I have a procedure we've developed over the years where it goes, when it goes into the ground, I dig it out, of course, get mm -hmm. some nice loose soil. Mm -hmm. I put a bit of bone meal, yeah. um, mm -hmm. dig, scatter, dig that in a bit. I use a bit of root grow. to yep. for the, A bit of friendly fungi. The friendly fungi, which, yep. uh, okay, well, it's, uh, don't know how effective it is, but it 
it's said effective, to be. I think, generally, in the yeah, gardening trade. It's, 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 uh, it's said to be, and it's, uh, yeah. you know, you only get one go for a tree, don't Indeed, you? Indeed, so, that's so it. So best to put it in. Then I use, uh, well, out in the open where I am, I have rabbits and deers and mm-hmm. voles, got the lot. Okay. So I, I, I fill it in with nice, nicely crumbled soil. I put a stake in. I, I used to use some of the maybe sub fifty millimeter ones, but they didn't seem to last very long. So okay. I tend to go a little bit bigger now. Yeah. About I prefer short stakes, so I buy maybe a nine hundred millimeter. Yeah. One. So ending up with about thirty above the ground, something yep. like that. I use a uh, a buckle cable tie. Right. Okay. On it, which I prefer to the other ones. Right. Very positive things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I put a vole guard on, which we started to do. Voles l- absolutely love, and rabbits absolutely love apples. There's something about apples. They do, they're attractants, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. And having lost a few early on, I, I bought 500. Right. Uh, so every tree I ever planted would have a vole guard for, until it gets... And they, they, they're about 20 centimetres long. Okay. They, they're um, self-expanding. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they seem to stop the voles. Yes. Right. So... That goes on standard. I use a, a mulch mat. Right, okay. And I put a, again, what sort of tree guard do you use? Well, I don't like the sort of traditional spiral ones okay. on apple trees myself. And <laughs> anyway, the deer just bite it off down to the, yeah, to the, the height. Mm-hmm. I, I, I find they're, they're great for woodland trees, mm-hmm. that, which generally don't get attacked the same amount. So I, I'm, I just buy 50 metre lengths of chicken wire and cut them into one metre lengths, which makes me a, a one. 30 centimeter diameter cylinder. Right. I use the stake, tie it to the stake, mm-hmm. bend it right round, and use a bamboo cane to join it to, so I can open it Get up. You. Ah, that's a good idea. And mm. That way, that's, that's seems to be everything proof. Right. Now, mm-hmm. the, the young tree is then totally enclosed growing yes. up. All oh, right, branches come out and they do get nibbled, but that, at least they doesn't seem to matter too much. Right. And gradually they go up. I then prune it up gradually. It's generally said that it's good to have side branches on young trees. It helps thicken the, the trunk. Yes. So I'd, I'd gradually prune it up over the years. It might take three years to get maybe even longer on some before the lowest branches at the top of the wire. I'm aiming to get my lowest branches eventually at one and a half, two metres. Right. So, um, so I can get under to, yeah. to cut it. Mm-hmm. So as it goes up, you just keep raising it. A bit yeah. more. Yeah. Raising the crown. Raising it? the crown. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the term, terminology. Yeah, yeah. And you do you do all your pruning then, I suppose, either in the summer or the winter, you wouldn't, or is it just ad hoc with the, the side with, branches? With, with those? Ah, well, the other big thing I do, once it gets above the wire, is I tie down. Because okay. you want the, a lot of trees just want to go up. Mm-hmm. And I want them to go sideways yeah. uh, to fill out. So once they're above the wire, I use... Baler twine, actually, mm-hmm. which splits open. You, you must never have anything round a branch that, that could throttle it. So the beauty of baler twine is you just put a knot on the end and you can slip it over and then it self-expands. So mm-hmm. you can't. I tie that down to the wire guard. So, so right. pulling all the branches to just a bit above a horizontal. What that does is get the structure much quicker. Right. If you've got to prune it on branches that are more going up, you've got to, it's going to take several years to keep going out. Well, you can achieve it in one or two years Excellent. by, by right. that technique. Uh, you've got to remember to go back and release. It's amazing how much growth you get in a year. You think, did I really tie that branch down? You know, it's I, mean, I suppose because it's growing horizontal, you're going to get more sort of lateral growth from that. Yes, because of the, yeah, the and it's going to fruit a lot quicker. Yeah. Right. So okay. you can often get fruiting within three years of uh, having grafted it, which is. Um, what we all want. It we is, all... Yes. So that young tree then, um, I mean, we, we sort of touched on about feeding earlier, about really how unnecessary when it's mature, as far as an orchard tree. But when you come into your younger trees, would you do any any little bit of uh, feeding at that point just to, to establish or that the preparation of the soil you've done should be sufficient for the tree? Well, to, to I haven't, that? but mm. maybe that just reflects the site. The site mm. I've got is fertile. It, it had sheep on it. Um, mm. It has long grass on it. Now, long grass, you've got to think about soil structure. Mm-hmm. What grows up goes down. So if you let the grass grow long, you get deep roots. Deep roots pull up all sorts of things, good things. That's the philosophy I've got of, of letting it grow, not keeping it like a lawn, but letting it go up uh, as well as being good for, 
for the wildflowers and uh, and mm. other vegetation, it has a chance. Yeah, that, so that's uh, so feeding. I've done none nope. yet. Yes. I'm not saying I never will, nope. but will if I had a tree that was sulking, you might just give it sweet. I might. Just to I might try it. it. Yeah, I am feeding different subject a little bit. I'm playing with peaches at the moment, and and you take a different philosophy with things Stone like that. Fruits, yes, uh, yeah. as well because you you following the philosophy of a of a 1940s successful commercial peach grower in Suffolk. His his philosophy was you need to feed the trees really heavily, uh, which you don't want to do with an apple tree generally. No, it's because they're vegetative normally enough, aren't they? Yeah, but because you because you in that case you may be fighting peach leaf girl and things different. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, and some sort of things. I mean, you if it seems appropriate, experiment with it, try it. But apples, all mine are too strong. Yeah. So there's no question of yeah. getting any feed. Maybe if it didn't fruit, I might <laughs> give it a bit of yeah. And what, what about the, um, the you know the ideas of obviously uh, avoiding uh, pests and diseases? I mean, obviously growing the, the trees nicely spaced and obviously pruning them during the winter, opening the, the canopy out, getting air circulation in there. I suppose yeah. that's key. But again, do you look at using any pheromone traps or any any winter washes for your trees at all? No, I haven't. I mean, I've I've played with uh, codling moss traps at mm-hmm. home. I had an apple tree. Yeah. Um, well, you catch a few, but you still get it. I'm working on the philosophy that I should have so many apples, <laughs> already have plenty, <laughs> plenty that, yeah. that I'll just leave those. Yeah, leave those to the birds. Yeah, not everybody's in that fortunate position. But that my philosophy is grow too many, pick the ones out yeah. that are good. Yeah. bit of rosy aphid on the leaf on some of the trees, which seems to be the most damaging that I've seen. It Especially make, this year. Yeah, this year. Has was become, it? Yeah, well, yeah, right. yeah. certainly. Uh, I think yeah. because of perhaps the cold weather in April yeah. uh, and the very wet May we had, perhaps that was the perfect storm it, for It, it for could aphids. be. Yeah. Well, they, they do mess up the growth, don't they, they terribly? Do. They do. You get this sort of zigzag yeah. effect, yeah. which isn't at all nice, and, no. and it never puts itself right, so it, off it comes. Really. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Not really seeing anything else uh, mm. yet. Good, oh, good. So, uh, Michael, we, we, we sort of touched on um, sort of rootstock, so perhaps we could just broaden out a little bit. Obviously, there's lots of different rootstocks available if you're going to be doing your own uh, scion, um, effectively your own uh, cuttings. Yes. We mentioned earlier, obviously, about the favourite one, the 106. Uh, MM106. Um, 106, yeah. Yeah, that's a good standard one yeah. in, to, in between. Maybe a bit big for small gardens. I mean, if, if you, well... Unless you've got a big garden, you can't really grow side of apples, can no, you? No. Uh, because where are you going to get your volume from? Yeah. Uh, if you've got a really big garden or a field, mm-hmm. fine. So uh, mostly you're going to grow dessert cookers, so you're going to be using M26 and mm-hmm. maybe M27 if you're yep. really small. Yeah. I'm not, M9 seems to be used a lot by commercial people, I've mm. seen. I'm not, I suppose that's quite sure where that fits in, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, certainly the commercial growers, because they use them on a, a cordon system or on a very it, it, restricted it, it, system. Is that what it's... Yeah. it's yeah. Generally, yeah. yeah. And then they've got them on frameworks and wires, because, of course, we know with rootstocks, the, 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 the shorter the number, the smaller the number, the, the less structured the root systems are. In fact, right. the weaker the root system mm. is. So that's why M26 and M106 probably do best in the in the field, effectively, because they're yes. stronger. Yeah, I suspect. yeah. Yeah, from... From our work at the garden centre here, that's that's what we've sort of concluded. That, M M one and six seems to be the most popular, doesn't yeah. it? It's yeah. a good if you don't know what to go for. Yeah, go and, for that. And most of the commercial people growing um, fruit trees for the garden centre and nursery trade tend to go for that. That's that what they offer. Yeah. Yeah. Can you yeah, yeah. can you specify if you you had can a, yeah. you can <laughs> yeah. And I know a lot of our customers, which is fine, want obviously yes. Yeah, M27 or M9s. Right. Yeah. However, they're not grown in the huge quantities, and I think they're in. If you know that you're going to go down that route, you need to, you know, get your order in to your to your, your retailer nice and early. So hopefully they, they can then source them from a from yes. a commercial grower. Yeah. And of course, the the original orchard rootstock was M111, wasn't it? That was that was the the well, one. Well, one 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 is pushed as being good for wet sites. Okay. I've played a little bit with one one ones, but. They don't really seem to grow very fast, so okay. I don't know if that's okay. just me or yep. or what. Yep. Um, or, yep. well, I think I've still got some rootstocks sat in my nursery, waiting for me to decide what to put on them. 
but yeah, I haven't had the success that I thought w- would have with one one ones. Yeah. Well, of course, the the really really old one was Paradise, wasn't it? Was it okay? Before they got all these these ones, uh, I, I learnt this from people in the village saying, "What are these funny little golden apples that are on my tree?" And I took them along to Bob Lever, actually, who's an expert apple guy over in the east of England, and he instantly said, "That's paradise. It's the rootstock. the The original had died." And right. uh, when you see little little golden, quite sharp, you can cook with them actually, mm-hmm. but not the sort of thing that anybody would have planted, you know. So. No, no. Okay, Michael, we're talking about varieties, and goodness me, there's so so many varieties. I always read the fact that you can eat a, a different variety ap- an apple a day effectively through the whole of the year if mm, you're if yes. you're canny enough to to know the right varieties but sort of locally and regionally and across the uk how, do you see any any sort of differences in varieties and the, the ilks out there well certainly when i lived in yorkshire brought up in yorkshire i was aware that there were lots of things you couldn't grow there are apples that are recommended for the north Presumably, I don't know about what they grow in Scotland, but I think mm. it's a lot more restricted. Down south in Cornwall and Devon, of course, it's much wetter down there and milder. In I don't know about eating apples, but there are a lot of very specific cider apples from that area. I'm experimenting with them. I okay. can't tell you yet whether they're... I haven't had an obvious success from a lot of them yet, but... Uh, early days. Early days, yeah. yeah. yeah you have yeah. to keep going. Yeah, Round... Us round North Bucks, uh, I suppose we we can grow most things. Um, mm-hmm. It's a bit a little bit dry round here. If anything, we seem to miss a lot of the rain. We I, do indeed. I, I feel. Yes. Yep. Uh, so I suppose that I'm not sure I've e- ever managed to identify which varieties are more drought proof than others. Mm. I'm not sure whether that's probably more rootstock based than right. variety. Things that I, from an eating point of view, and and go in the cider as well. I love things like Winter Gem and Sunset and Chivers Delight, mm-hmm. some of the less known ones that, rather than, they're, they're, they're coxy type apples without the cox problems. I mean, cox is a, a very disease prone tree, so never plant a cox. I, first eating apple I put in my garden at home was a cox, and, and it. You, re- you regretted it? I regretted it. I don't know why I don't pull it out, I just spend my time. <laughs> Uh, so I can practice my pruning on, I think, <laughs> of, of pruning off dead and diseased bits. Oh dear. So, no, I, uh, there, there are so many better things than a cox. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, cox apples are lovely. Mm. In fact, I, I gather 90% of it, because they're so blemished, 90% of them go in juice anyway. Perfect. Yeah, perfect for the for the cider production then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so there, there are lots of really nice... Apples Holstein is, is one that I think I first tasted here that um, Sarah Juniper was pushing. So that, that's something a bit different, mm. special. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because at our uh, Cyan uh, weekend, we always get requests for uh, Pink Lady, which of course is this variety yeah. which has been manufactured. I use that word, yeah, named. It's a New Zealand apple which obviously comes into the supermarkets and everybody obviously enjoys the flavour. Not too sure why, mind you. No, but, well, uh, yeah, yeah, everybody's choice is the different. The crispness, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, it's something we, we can't actually grow in this country. And it's, of course, it's sold under the name Pink Lady as a marketing ploy, but it's actually called Crips. Right. Which, um, when yeah. I did a bit of investigation, I thought it was quite quite interesting. And of course, yes, you, you can't get hold of the, the sign wood in the UK to even grow it, but it wouldn't grow very particularly well in it, the UK. It may not, no. I mean... Yeah. Uh, some of these apples need extra uh, long season, warm season to ripen. So, mm. uh, again, from my childhood, I, I remember apples like Dun Sealing and Sturmer Pippin as really nice winter apples, really hard but lovely tasting. I'm trying to grow them here, but they don't haven't had much success in getting them to ripen yet. So, yes, you do. You've got to be a bit careful. Some some apples are not going to give their best, no. uh, unless you've got a warm spot. Mm-hmm. Depends where you are in the country. Yeah. So perhaps it's just as well we, we can't grow Pink Lady because yeah, yeah. Let, let them supply it. Indeed. And much better, we've got better things. We have. That. That's, that's the thing. This is the opportunity for them to export something yeah, yeah. which we can actually enjoy. Yeah, going to be so much more important now Brexit's happened. Indeed. Yes, yeah, so even more so, perhaps. Mm. So to put you on the spot about you know your, your favourite apple varieties, do you, do you have... Well, yeah, things things like 
Chiver's Delight is nobody seems to know Chiver's Delight. It it's really tasty. It's very reliable for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it lasts a few months, so it, it probably comes beginning of October. I'll start eating those and it'll last till Christmas time. So that's you, when you when you award points for all sorts of aspects, yeah. good flavour. Yep. Those later apples are usually the nicest, aren't they? I mean, the early yeah. apples are yeah, uh, a bit. N- not not so good at the moment. I'm actually eating bardsies in where, where we were sort of mid mid September. Uh, they've just started. That's a nice, nice crisp, good flavoured, but not heavy. It's quite a light apple. Uh, recommend that. I think I bought it from you some years ago. I think you supplied. Uh, came from the the Welsh island. Indeed, famous uh, famous Welsh island. Yeah. Uh, what will be next? Um, well, that will last a, a couple of weeks, maybe. Uh, hopefully, we'll get on to. The, Things like the uh, Sunset, mm-hmm. so, which is a really good Cox replacement. That, um, Sunset's really, really nice. Right. Okay, so I'm going to put you on that desert island now. Oh, so, right. So yeah. if you had to choose, choose one. one, which would it be? Well, if I happen to be on this desert island and end up with, it, with my wife, right. I'm going to choose Sunset because... Okay. Uh, no, no, sorry, not sunset. Suntan. Suntan. It's okay. different. It's different apple. Sunsets. Yeah, sun. I must get it right. <laughs> suntan. Right. That, that's really an apple I like, and she particularly likes. So, okay. in interest of harmony. Oh my word! Very important on a desert yeah. island, especially. Um, if I was on my own. Yeah. Then perhaps I'll go for Holstein. Holstein. Excellent. Right. That's really good. Well, I, whichever desert island you're on, it would be good to grow any apples, yes. provided the weather conditions would allow. Yes. Um, Michael. We usually ask our podcast guests for a joke, and mm. we would like something sort of fruit themed. Fruity. Do you, did you do you have anything? Well, I'm not very good on jokes, but um, there is the story of the doctor and the pomologist. Okay. So the the doctor, his hobby was growing roses, and the pomologist, well, he was just a boring pomologist, and he just grew apples. And these two guys both had an interest in the same lady. And every morning, the doctor would go into his garden and pick the most beautiful red rose. And he would take it along and offer it to the lady. And every afternoon, the pomologist went into his orchard and picked the shiniest, biggest red apple he could find. And he took that along to offer to the lady. This went on for some time, and the um, lady, she could suss out what the doctor was at, but wasn't quite sure what the pomologist was doing, so she asked him the next time he came along, and he said, well, you know what they say, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) Excellent. I didn't see that coming. No, that's 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 good. <laughs> oh, it's been it's been really fascinating to, to chat to you, Michael. We've we've learned so much about orchards, orchard fruits. I mean, we're talking apples, but it, it's just an immense subject, and it you've is. you've shined so much light on the subject and the practicalities of of creating your own orchards. Um, Michael, thank you very much for the, your time today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, nice to chat. Thank you. Well, I knew there was a lot of apples and, and varieties of apples in the world, Chris, but yeah. I had no idea it was sort of two and a half, three thousand or different varieties. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? And yeah, it's a scary number. And I think how many we, we sort of actually see day to day, you know, we're going down to the supermarket or go to our farm shop. Um, it's, yeah, you're it's, lucky if you've got sort of 10 or 15 varieties. Oh, and, that's um, not a good day. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, historically, we've sold apples here from New Creation Farm and generally had sort of six to eight varieties mm. available sort of in the eating season but yeah it is incredible the difference in flavors and the difference in sort of textures and colors and most definitely yes and that's what makes them such a, an appealing fruit yeah and uh, if you're thinking about growing an apple chris mm. uh, i guess is it like a lot of different plants where you do need to be a bit con- bit considerate of, sort of your local environment and your local temperature and 
how much rain you're going to get. And Most definitely, yes. And do yeah, at the end of the day, you know, these varieties are obviously grown everywhere and everywhere, and there's a reason sometimes they, they appear where they appear. And if they prefer, obviously, uh, you know, a faster draining soil or they prefer a warmer growing climate, you know, you think of your Cox's Orange Pippin, your Golden Delicious especially, yep. They need that sort of conditions where it's conducive to good, you know, uh, soil and also a better climate. I mean, in the garden, of course, we can sort of manipulate that a little bit by creating a microclimate, maybe growing our fruits against a, you know, a wall or a fence, espaliering them. There's some things we can do or grow them in pots where we can mollycoddle the plants a little bit more. But if you're growing like, uh, obviously, Michael's growing in an orchard, then yes, you do need to follow the, the patterns. They're out in the open, and yeah, like you say, sort of you think traditional walled gardens where you've got the mm. apple trees and the, the stone fruits sort of trained along the southern facing wall of the uh, of the garden, where it gets the extra heat off the wall, and That's, I guess that makes a yes bit of difference. Yeah, I mean, Michael did mention right at the beginning of our conversation about uh, the first variety he grew, which was James Grieve. I mean, that's a yep. good example of a variety which, you know, um, is pretty resistant to frost. It's quite a hardy plant, and obviously he was growing that up, obviously, up in the in Yorkshire. Yep. It was actually bred in Edinburgh, so it was even further north. Yes, in here, this area, you know, James Greaves grows remarkably well. So, yes, if you do your research, check the, you know, your catalogue when you, your, uh, you know, your mail order fruit catalogue arrives, scrutinise carefully the varieties and just check that it's ticking the box for your for your location. And then hopefully you'll get a good crop of apples. Most definitely, yeah. And the thing is, because you've done that extra homework, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, you, you spend all this time planting, getting the plants established. You want to be rewarded with a with a good crop. Definitely. So traditionally, Apple Day is the 21st of October. I think it was started back in 1990, was it? By it. Who was it who started it, Chris? So, yeah, it's Common Ground. They were a, they are a sort of market force out there to promote the, the diversity and the dynamism of, of apples and what they can do. And, yep. I mean, not just for, for eating and growing, but actually commercially as well. So they okay. really crusaded and they felt... It would be really good to celebrate in a big way annually our sort of love affair with this amazing fruit. And uh, yes, and you know, thirty-one years on, and it's still going strong. Yeah, because um, yeah, I mean, like we said, there are just hundreds and hundreds of varieties, and they are all so different. I mean, uh, I was a bit gutted. Went into the tunnel today, and there was no, no Egremont russets left. We no. sold them all already. <laughs> it's like no. We have to go be a bit more organised and get some more. But anyway, yeah, so just thinking sort of roots. If you want to grow your own apple, mm -hmm. is it something that, I mean, Michael talked about scion wood mm. and grafting. Is that something that a beginner can do or is it something that possibly needs a bit more research and possibly watch someone do it first or get someone to help you the first time you do it? I would say yes to those points, Peter. I think you need to, it's quite a, a bold statement to do uh, grafting. It involves a knife once, you know, you, 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 yep. you're dealing with a, a nice uh, sharp instrument. So you need to know sort of what you're doing. So yeah, if you can pop yourself along to a, a grafting day, um, usually they're in, uh, in, in the winter. Uh, we usually hold ours here at the garden centre in February and watch how it's done. Um, you know, learn from the from the professionals, and then you might feel confident then uh, to to have a go, um, or leave it in their capable hands. But uh, I think uh, it's the terminology when it comes to grafting. You can get people down a little bit. It's there's a lot of words yep. we have to get our heads around. And uh, yeah, Michael mentioned cyan wood, and that can put people off. But cyan wood basically is is the variety. So it's the one variety okay. you want to increase yeah yeah because you know, like you said so you can't grow apples from pips or, no. or you can grow apples from pips but they won't come true to what the apple you <laughs> took the pip from no you, you get, you'll definitely get a bit of a Heinz 57 if you try and uh, try and grow them from seed so normally when we have a, a grafting day um, you, it's usually interspersed with or combined with a a, a scion exchange or a scion swap okay whereby people bring their unusual varieties. Some of these are heritage varieties. Some will be cider varieties, uh, eaters, cookers, the whole menagerie, basically. And they bring wood for people to basically increase their option of, of, of growing. You know, they would never probably see these varieties. Garden centres and nurseries perhaps wouldn't grow them. Um, so it's a good opportunity then to uh, find, you know, varieties very maybe very localised to you to have a go at. So a sign wood exchange 
is probably just as good as a grafting day for the for for people who want to explore new varieties. Now you say possibly find something that grows really well in their local mm. area that's being promoted uh, around that area. Yeah. So a good way to get a good strong apple growing in your garden. Most definitely, and also you you'll really come across you know varieties which potentially have been lost in time, and these are the only way which are, are kept by by keen uh, apple uh, growers to, to preserve. So it is part of our heritage. So we we should really uh, you know encourage these sort of events if we can to to keep that biodiversity that gene pool out there available to us to to use. Brilliant. So moving forwards, Chris, our next show, Trees for Small Gardens. Indeed, yes. So we're going to be looking at all the different species out there which are suitable for our smaller plots, whether we're just using them purely for an ornamental feature or we're using them for a good reason of screening out our neighbours, um, yeah. those overlooking windows and such like. We, we seem to be plagued with, with, with smaller developments now. So hopefully we'll get a, a lot of interest there. And if any of our Digit audience have any questions, please you know pop, up, pop them over through, through our normal uh, social media channels and we'll try and uh, get those answered for you as well. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Peter. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.